Next, from Chicago, Eddie Johnson, the superintendent of the Chicago Police Department, gives an address at the City Club of Chicago on progress made toward improving the city's public safety. This runs about 50 minutes. Thank you, Jay. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for being here to listen to a, an important presentation by the superintendent. While gun violence may not affect your particular neighborhood or community, if it affects, if it impacts anybody in the city of Chicago, it's a Chicago problem. And I want to thank you all for being here to hear from the superintendent about his strategy. I also want to call out and thank Frank uh, also for being here uh, as head of the Chicago Public Schools because in the end of the day, it's not an accident that in the superintendent giving his presentation about public safety, you actually don't see pictures of police officers. You see pictures of kids, which is a testament to the superintendent and what he understands is the mission of the city of Chicago when it comes to public safety. That it's very, very important that if our kids are making it to school, they're thinking of their studies, not their safety. And I think the pictures up here are a testament to who Eddie Johnson is, the values his parents taught him, and what he seeks as his mission as the superintendent of the police department. This is an individual who grew up in Chicago's housing projects to make it to the most prominent position in the Chicago Police Department. He's a Chicago, he's Chicago proud and we're proud of Eddie Johnson. Eddie, I wanna thank you for being here. I'm not done with yet. <laughs> I saw you moving that seat there, Eddie. <laughs> Second is, you're gonna hear a lot from the superintendent. Today's remarks are significant on a couple of accounts. First and foremost, we were down, Eddie and I were down in the seventh district in Englewood earlier this week, showing people from out of town who had heard about what is happening at the situation room, the strategic room with the shot spotter. Right now, Englewood in the seventh district has the lowest amount of shootings in recorded history for Englewood. <laughs> October alone, the seventh district was down 70%. That's not just off of 2016, they're actually farther down below 2015 and are actually leading the city in that effort. And the measure which is reflected of the, also this picture. And the commander, Johnson, in the set, we only hire people that are named Johnson at the end of the day, okay? <laughs> you want a promotion in the police department, change your name. <laughs> but at the end of the day, the commander said something I had never heard, which I think is significant. The superintendent will talk to you about the technology, go through the data. Overall in the city, we're down 20% this year different districts doing far better. What was the biggest measure of success? Not a piece of data statistically. 500 kids showed up on Halloween at the seventh district to do trick or treat at the haunted house because they feel comfortable with what's happening with the police department and specifically in that district. And as a gentleman said, a longtime resident to Commander Johnson of the seventh district, I don't know what you all are doing, but keep doing what you're doing. And that, in the end of the day, that building of bonds between the police department and the kids who felt comfortable enough and their parents comfortable enough as in the district office of the seventh district that they would come there for Halloween, 500 long with a long line of kids dressed up in their Halloween outfits. That, in the end of the day, was the measure. I, the superintendent and I can go over all the data and talk to you each district, where they are, what's happening. In the end of the day, that barrier, that wall, that psychological wall have been taken down. And the results not only are successful work by the men and women of the uh, police department, not just statistically, the progress, not success, the progress being made, but the real measure was that they felt that that district, the seventh district on 63rd was theirs. And there was a bond of a trust and comfort that the commander and the rank and file that make up that district felt. And when you put that together, 
There is no technology, although the superintendent will talk about it, there is no technology as strong as that tr level of trust, cooperation, and commitment that came forward by both the children, but more importantly by their parents who felt that close enough and that camaraderie with the police department. In the end of the day, the city of Chicago's efforts are about putting more police on the street and getting kids, guns, and gangs off the street, which is why it's so significant in the budget that we're taking up next week. We will have a record investment in after-school programs, summer jobs, safe passage routes, and mentoring for our young men and women. It is significant that we're adding a th uh, nearly 1,000 new officers, but is what is also significant is we're up to 115,000 kids in after-school programs, 31,000 kids that are gonna be in a summer job program, and 84,000 kids on a safe passage route. Kids that can smile because they have a future and they know that the city cares about them. And I also want to compliment, and I've said this before at our graduations, but I'm going to say it here. We all know that the superintendent took over the helm of the police department at a very critical time for the city of Chicago. We are on the road to reform, and we're never going to get off. We are going to make sure our officers are the best professionally trained and proactive, upholding exactly what their training has set out to do for them. So while we could talk about what happened also in Englewood. We also saw what's gone on in the paper, and there is zero tolerance for any officer not upholding the highest standards we have set for him and her. I want to commend the, command, the superintendent for taking over at a critical time in the Chicago Police Department. We have a vested interest in their success. He has not only led them through that change and continue to stay on that change and been clear that there's no getting off that road to reform, but also doing it in a way that builds the bonds of trust with the residents that, they're that they are assigned to help serve and protect. And the results of that are the results of what I told you about the 7th District, about what the, uh, what the one lifelong resident said, what the family said when they showed up at the 7th District with some of the other data and the investments we're making, but also being clear to the men and women who actually give of themselves to the city, that we expect the most of you and will invest the most in you, and that is there is going to be zero tolerance for ever deviating from that. I cannot say enough, if I've given more time, I would say more things about the superintendent who has to wake up on a regular basis to my phone call before he's up. <laughs> So try to treat him nicely because I'm on him all the time in the morning. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my good friend, Eddie Johnson, the superintendent. Good afternoon. I want to thank the mayor for that uh, really, really rousing introduction. Before I get started on where we are, I just want to take a moment to thank many of you all in this room for the well wishes and support that you gave my son and I through the uh, kidney surgery process. I cannot tell you all what that meant to me and him. You know, we just were not expecting the city of Chicago to prop us up the way that you all did. And I, you know, Webster still doesn't have a word to properly articulate my gratitude for that. So I just simply say thank you. So I want to thank the, the mayor again for that introduction and sharing with you all the roadmap of our city's comprehensive strategy for public safety. It's an all hands on deck effort and the mayor has been our biggest supporter to be quite, quite honest. And I'd like to thank the city club for inviting me back to speak about the progress we've made in public safety since the last time I was here last year. For nearly two years, CPD has redoubled efforts to rebuild fractured public trust and address gun violence at the hands of repeat gun offenders, which reached unacceptable levels in the year of 2016. And that's why when I became superintendent last year, I challenged my leadership team to take a hard look at everything that we were doing with the goals of one, building integrity with the communities that we serve, providing greater resources to our officers, 
expanding training and support for in-service members, and ultimately make Chicago safer for everyone. The collective response to that challenge served as, a, as the basis for our revitalized and re reimagined crime strategy for 2017. Side by side with our crime strategy is a significant list of planned and in progress reforms in the areas of personnel, use of force, training, transparency, and last but not least, community policing efforts. That's one of the things that I believe to be among the most significant pieces of our plan is bringing district level smart policing to officers directly on the beat in a series of district strategic decision support centers. And in those centers, we combine civilian crime analysts with predictive crime software, gunshot detection systems, and high definition cameras. The information that the analysts and intelligence officers develop is then delivered without delay to the officers in the field on mobile phones that we provide to them. These state-of-the-art tools allow officers and civilian analysts to work smarter and faster, monitor gang conflicts in real time, and make changes to our strategy as the situations dictate. This mix of people and technology is, is quite literally at the crossroads, crossroads of human intuition and the predictive power of data. In rolling out this new approach, we focused on six police districts on the south and west sides, traditionally where gun violence has presented the greatest challenges, not just in 2016, but over decades. Inglewood, Harrison, Deering, Austin, Gresham, and North Lawndale. The early signs of progress in these districts are incredibly promising. Inglewood was the first community where we deployed the support centers and has been fully operational since February of this year. Today, I never thought I'd say this in my police career that, that spans almost 30 years now. This, this still amazes me. Inglewood is leading the city of Chicago in violence reduction this year, Inglewood. And I, I just really cannot say enough about the, the, the leadership over there and the officers that work in that district that helped get us there. As I speak to you today, Inglewood has seen a 45% reduction in shootings and a 43% reduction in homicides compared with 2016. And shootings are down nearly 24% from the year 2015, which we considered not a bad year. In raw numbers, think about this for a moment. In raw numbers, that's nearly 150 fewer people who were shot in just that one community compared to last year, and that's, that's a huge win. In fact, Inglewood is now at its lowest level of gun violence that we've seen since the turn of this century. Let me repeat that. Inglewood, right now, is at the lowest level of gun violence that we've seen there since the turn of this century. That's incredible. <laughs> Across all six police districts where we've rolled out this new te technology, shootings are down 25% compared with last year, outpacing the reductions that we're seeing citywide, which stands at about 20%. In raw numbers, citywide, Nearly 650 people less have been shot in Chicago this year, with 18 out of 22 police, police districts seeing reductions in violence. So that's 650 families that haven't been traumatized this year because of gun violence. A recent analysis by the University of Chicago Crime Lab has pointed out that right now, we can say with certainty that our smart policing strategy has directly contributed to the violence reductions we've seen in those six districts. Now, this is not a cause for celebration, but it's actually a call for further action and continued investment in those communities. In the mayor's proposed budget for next year, he's promised the resources that CPD needs to roll out six more strategic decision support centers, and I'm grateful for his support in that, t in that strategy. And that's why I'm happy to announce here today that Grand Crossing and South Chicago districts will be the next two districts to come online with this technology by the end of January 2018. Later next year, we'll continue the expansion 
to Wentworth, Calumet, Chicago Lawn, and Grand Central Districts. It's our mission to ensure that safety is not reserved for one community or one area in the city, but instead it's a right that every Chicagoan deserves and will get. <laughs> New technology combined with the human intelligence is an important component of realizing that mission. So we'll create, so we're creating a culture of accountability in our neighborhoods when the repeat gun offender bill that Mayor Emanuel and I fought for in Springfield, the Safe Neighborhoods Reform Act, that goes into effect this coming January. We'll also continue to fight in Springfield to stymie the flow of thousands of illegal firearms that come into our city by holding gun dealers accountable also. But technology and legislation will only take us so far. We also need the human component to bridge all the efforts together. At the beginning of 2017, we embarked on a large scale two-year investment in personnel to add nearly 1,000 officers to the department above any existing vacancies. This additional per personnel, which is being deployed throughout the city, will provide neighborhoods with the officers and detectives that they need to build greater community partnerships, reduce crime, and solve more cases. Our strategy also provides that the appropriate levels of supervision so that officers can be properly mentored and provided the guidance that they need to be successful partners with the communities that they serve. As we move into the second year of our plan, as they have in 2017, nearly 100 new recruits will enter the training academy each month until the end of the year 2018. These new officers and supervisors will be guided by our revo revised use of force policy, which went into effect this past October. To ensure that we put a policy in place that's unique to Chicago, we asked for the first time in police department's history, we asked input from both the public that we serve and for the police officers that we expect to carry out this mission. The end result is a policy that is centered around the sanctity of life and de-escalation. Quite simply, we guide our officers on the principle that all life, all life is sacred and that we'll attempt to de-escalate any situation wherever possible before the use of force is warranted. It also calls for officers to immediately render aid that is consistent with their training once a scene is safe. In instances where they may witness prohibited force being used, the officers must verbally intervene and report any misconduct that they witness. All sworn members of the department have received an initial four-hour classroom-based course on the policy, and beginning in 2018, They'll also receive additional scenario-based instruction covering the topics of force mitigation and mental health awareness. Beyond preparing officers for policing under this new policy, it also marked the launch of a landmark four-year training initiative. Starting next year, CPD will require all department members to, say, to take a set number of continue, continuing education hours on a yearly basis. With 16 mandatory hours in 2018, and by the year 2021, 40 hours annually. This training will cover a mixture of mandatory and elective topics, from cultural competency and human rights to medical rescue and traffic stops, with a use of force refresher as an annual requirement. And I got to tell you, as now a 30-year veteran, that really excites me, because I tell you all, the last time I got regular training like that was the year 1988 when I entered the training academy. So that's how significant this training module will be moving forward. This will literally change the face of policing in Chicago ensure and ensure that officers continue to refresh or reset their skill set as officers, and they will now receive up-to-date annual training on the latest trends and best practices in law enforcement. It's a win for the community, a win for the department, and a win for our officers that patrol the streets every day. We've also been working to provide every officer on regular patrol with body-worn cameras and a taser. By the end of this year, every beat officer responding to a service call will be equipped with a body-worn camera, and that is a full year of the projected schedule that we had last year. By the end of 2018, Every beat officer will also be equipped with their own taser. 
The tasers will give officers a less lethal option when the use of force is necessary. The body-worn cameras will allow us to see exactly what occurs during those interactions with the public. This level of transparency has never been seen before, but it'll go a long way in protecting the rights of those we serve, as well as protecting the rights of the officers. It'll let us see what we're doing right, and also let us see where we need to improve. For me, what really ties all of these investments together is making community policing a philosophy throughout the department where every Chicago police officer is a community policing officer. It began with the formation of the Community Policing Advisory Panel, chaired by Chief of Patrol Fred Waller, and made up of national experts, community residents, mm -hmm. and Chicago Police Department staff. And it's similar to how we approached our use of force policy. The panel held a number of meetings to receive feedback from our officers and the public and reviewed more than 2,200 surveys to, de to develop a set of recommendations for a community policing strategy that's unique and specific to the city of Chicago. Among what I consider to be the most important recommendations are number one, moving the community policing office under the direction of the Office of Superintendent, which we've already acted upon with the recent appointment of Deputy Chief uh, Dwayne Betts. And let me tell you why that's so significant. Before the community policing off office was under the Bureau of Patrol, and the message that that sent to the officers was that the Bureau of Patrol were the only ones responsible for community policing. Now, all police officers in CPD know it's a philosophy from the, for the department. Also, a strong focus on engagement with the city's youth and a more robust community-oriented training for department members. And lastly, an effective problem solving with the community and other city agencies, among other things. After reviewing the final report, I decided to accept and adopt those recommendations that were laid out because I firmly believe that we need to make significant investments to build the integrity within the communities that we serve. As part of that commitment, we will create a team of dedicated people to ensure that reforms are implemented properly the first time and are sustainable in the long term to truly change the way CPD does business. This is why the mayor and I requested funding in our 2018 budget for a new Office of Reform Management. In fact, the budget requests $27 million dedicated solely to police reform next year. So Alderman Bill, thank you also. <laughs> this reform management team, a first of its kind for the Chicago Police Department, will be part of my office and will continue to be guided by our next steps for reform framework that we released this past March, as well as action items from Mayor Emanuel's Police Accountability Task Force, also the U.S. Department of Justice report, and the upcoming consent decree with the Illinois Attorney General. The challenges that we're working to overcome were not created overnight, and they won't be solved overnight. But I believe, firmly believe, that we're making significant progress to achieve the goals we all share as Chicagoans when it comes to public safety. At the end of the day, that means a police department that, that just not the police superintendent or the mayor can be proud of, but a police department that the entire city can be proud of, and a police department that's working with the citizens of this great city to make Chicago safer. Thank you, and now I look forward to any questions that you might have. Um, I have heard that one negative impact on crime was the consent decree that requires officers to fill out forms every time they stop someone. Is that true? Can technology help speed up filling out the paperwork? Okay, well, it's, it is uh, a fact that we change the way we document our contact with the public, but the consent decree really has nothing to do with that. We haven't negotiated that yet. What that was was a, an agreement with the ACLU that we would document our, our contact with citizens differently. And what it did, what the difference was before we would fill out a contact card about this size to document our interaction with the public, that card morphed into a two-page form set that was more cumbersome, obviously, and it took up more time to fill out. Um, so our documented stops decreased significantly, but it's difficult for me to really compare 
the contact cards with this new form because they're just two different things. It's like comparing apples to oranges. But what I will tell you, although we saw documented stops reduce significantly, what we also saw was the fact that our overall gun arrests went up drastically. So what that told me was that the officers were lasering in on the right people and stopping them for the right reasons at the right time. So I'm still encouraged by that particular aspect, but that um, ISR report is what we call it, investigatory stop report. We're still talking to the ACLU to see if we can get that one trimmed down a bit. Okay, uh, this is from our uh, Board of Governors. Father Ryan, have you considered inviting President Trump to Chicago for a night ride along without the Secret Service? <laughs> With you in the Chicago PD to see the real news that you spoke about and not the president's fake news. <laughs> it's a city club. That is a great question. <laughs> okay. <sighs> no, I have not considered that. <laughs> but if the president would like to come here and, and actually see what's going on, you know, because I will say this. I'm becoming very recognizable around the country now when I travel to different events uh, involving law enforcement. And when I get off the plane and walk through airports, people say to me, wow, <laughs> how do you all survive up there? And, and that, that really chips me because it's a false narrative that the entire city is on fire. That's just not true. You know, we have pockets in the city where we have violence challenges. Uh, so I, I wish that uh, people would come here to actually see what we've done. As I said earlier, we have almost 700 less people shot in this city this year. And that's huge. It, it really is. It's not success, but it's progress. So I think that we have to do a better job of just pushing that narrative out there that we are seeing progress and gains in this city in terms of uh, violence reduction. But I'll invite anyone that wants to come here and see what Chicago is doing. I'll invite anyone to come and, and take a look at it. Okay, the next question, Superintendent, is from <clears throat> City Club member Wendy Cohn. Will domestic violence training be included in the new curriculum? You know what, domestic violence training has been included since I was a recruit back in 1988. So that's, a, um, that's something that we focus on because that's a, that's a huge part of some of the violence that we see in the city. So domestic violence training never left CPD and we will continue to make that better and adopt the best practices uh, across the country in terms of domestic violence training. Okay, this is from uh, Kent Kamen, I believe I may have Ms. Okay, Cayman, I'm sorry, with Sutton Place Financial, Inc. Specifically, what was done to bring down crime rate in Englewood? So I think it's a combination of things. Um, the technology, those strategic decision support centers that we went in there, that we put in, in the 7th District, helps a lot. Because what that does is it gives the commander the ability to look at data and uh, let that play a part in how he makes his decisions regarding deployment. But technology, is, is it, that's a tool. The real meat of it is the personnel that's over there that are making gains with having the community trust us. I, I tell you this, I've been a cop now for, for roughly 30 years, and, and I've been all over the city chasing criminals, gangbangers, you name it, I've done it. And I never thought I would see the day in Inglewood where you would have 500 kids trying to get into their Halloween haunted house because the people over there just didn't trust the police like that. That is really what tells me we're moving in the right direction because now not just those kids, it's easy for a three-year-old or five-year-old to trust the police. It's more difficult for the adults to trust the police. And the fact that those adults brought those 500 kids to that district to interact with the police, that's huge. So all of that stuff, when you put it in the mixing bowl, all of it matters. Okay, thank you. 
This is from uh, City Club member Dr. Bill Truesdale, and it's a question about the Citizen Academy. He thought it was very helpful in understanding the structure and process of CPD. Can the program be renewed? Yeah, we, we still have it. Uh, it's it's uh, conducted, I believe now the classes are once every week, but it's, it's a robust training. And, and I encourage all of you all to see what it is, because here's the thing. I don't think that people really recognize how difficult it is for police officers to do this job. This job is not easy. If you think it is, try doing it, you know, because it's not. You know, when you think about this, a police officer has to make a split-second decision on whether or not to use force or to use it. That's difficult. You know, it's, it's easy when you can sit back for two or three hours and pour over a video. That cop is making that decision in a split second. That's not easy. And one of the things that we encourage you all to do is go through that training. And uh, we have a um, scenario called shoot, don't shoot. Go through that and, and see how many people you kill. <laughs> because I guarantee you, you will kill a lot of people. You will. But that gives you a sense of what police officers go through on a daily basis. And being a cop that has been involved in shootings, I know firsthand how quickly it happens like that. You know, I've only been involved in one incident where it kind of it turned into a firefight. But the other incidents, a split second, you have to make that decision. So the, the Citizens Academy is still ongoing, but I, I encourage you all to, to check out that shoot, don't shoot scenario and, and see how you come out. And let me know. <laughs> if anybody was interested in that, how would they contact? Uh... So you'd either contact uh, Deputy Chief Dwayne Betts is now the uh, Deputy Chief uh, with community policing, and he will be a good resource for you all to reach out to. He's at headquarters. He's easy to find if you go on our website and contact him, or you can contact Deputy Chief Keith Calloway at the Training Academy to set up uh, a, a, a seat in that class. Great. This isn't your wife, is it? No. Mm -mm. Okay. <laughs> the Johnson name. It's all over the place. <laughs> Anyhow, this is a question from City Club member uh, Mrs. George Jane Johnson. That's why I asked the superintendent. <laughs> this is one of those loaded questions from his spouse. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant Kim Toy Huh was the daughter of my mentor when I first started teaching in the Chicago Public Schools. The bottom line of her question is, who was your mentor when you started, and why did you decide to become a police officer? You know, so... Um, the reason I be decided to become a police officer, way back in, in, when I was a teenager, um, my mom had a really good friend. And so quite naturally, we became good friends with, with this lady's children. And when I was about 16 years old, uh, one of her daughters went to a uh, party and was abducted, raped, and killed. And that really made me start thinking, what could I do to um, help change some things? And that was the impetus for me looking into becoming a police, uh, Chicago police officer. And the second thing, uh, and as far as a mentor, man, there are a lot of people that, that I was blessed with having a lot of good supervisors during my career to um, kind of guide me. But I think the ones that, that really come to mind most are probably Terry Hillard, who was a former superintendent, and Gene Williams, who retired as um, chief of support services but uh, you know like I said I I was fortunate enough to have a lot of good leadership that I could look up to and learn how to become the police okay uh, this is from Rebecca Levin who I think is with the Lurie Children's Hospital strengthening Chicago's youth the gains due to data driven police strategies over the last year are impressive but CPD doesn't do it alone. Can you describe the role of community organizations in reducing violence and how the department collaborates with these community organizations? I tell you, that's a great question because you're right on point with that wherever you are. Um, you're right, CPD can't do this alone. Those programs like BAM, Becoming a Man, things of that nature are huge in in helping us reduce this violence. Because I, I share this with you all. I went to speak to about 40 young men uh, a couple of months ago. Actually, it was before my surgery. 
And all of these, these out of these 40 individual, uh, black, Hispanic, and a few uh, whites were in that group. All 40 of them had committed violent crimes from shooting someone to armed robberies to carjacking. And we were in a group setting and we talked about what brought them around. So at the end of it, I didn't want any of those individuals to be corrupted by the answer that, that his buddy gave me. So I pulled each one of all 40, I pulled them aside individually and asked them, what got you out of that lifestyle? And I have to tell you all this. Every one of them told me the same thing, that somebody reached out to them and said, I care about you and I care about your life. So they, that gave them a sense that someone actually cared. And I'm not talking about parents. These were individual people that they didn't know. But that one thing meant a lot to these individuals. And, and you know, the mayor kind of touched on this earlier. For me as police superintendent, I know CPD can't do it alone. The benefits that we get from after school programs and mentoring programs is enormous because a lot of these kids involved in that lifestyle, all they're looking for is a way out of it. They are. Now, don't get me wrong. We got a small subsection of guys that just enjoy that life, you know, and, and okay, we got something for them too. <laughs> but the ones that <laughs> we do, but the ones that want to get out of it, we have really gotten good and efficient at taking external partners with us and knocking on, we are able to identify those individuals better now. And we'll go knock on their doors and offer them a way out of it. And I am happy to say, when we first started that program, they really, you know, I know, that, well, I won't say what they would tell us. <laughs> but now, for every five in the beginning, Zero would really take us up on that, and, but we just kept at it. And now it's about three out of every five take us up on that offer to get them out of that lifestyle. So that tells me that a lot of them, if we just give them a pathway out, they'll get out. Okay, thank you, Superintendent. Um, this is from Sabrina Gruntoli with Greeley and Hanson. Could you comment on how important support from the business community and organizations like the Chicago Police Foundation and others is in helping to advance current CPD initiatives. Oh, that, that's, that, that support is huge to us. You know, the mayor and the city council has been very receptive in the things that I've asked for since becoming superintendent. But, you know, let's face it, we still have budget restraints that, that we just can't fill. So the support from our corporate partners, the Police Foundation with John Roebuck and um, the Police Memorial Foundation has been huge because that allows us to fill in the gaps in terms of funding. These strategic decision support centers, they cost about 1.5 million roughly to stand up. That's not chump change. You know, if it was that easy, every city in this country have come in, you know, most of the major cities are coming in to look at what we're doing. If they were cheap, everybody would have them, but they're not. So, you know, the mayor and the city council has been gracious enough to give us a lot of money to get these things going. But the, the uh, philanthropy in Chicago and the business community has stepped up to the plate, I have to say. And as a matter of fact, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> because they, they have really stepped up to the plate to fill in the financial gaps that we need and, and, and the, the reduction in violence that we're seeing this year really is fully supported and a lot of that, that credit goes to our uh, corporate industry and our business community in helping us fund these projects. So thank you again. Thank you. And thank you Foundation and Memorial Foundation and that. This is a question from a Chicago Police Department widow. How does the, in your opinion, how does the city justify stripping Chicago Police Department widows and retirees of health insurance benefits leading to widow homelessness in some cases? You know, that's a great question. And I have to be honest and tell you, I wasn't aware of that. But now that you've brought that to my attention, I will absolutely look into that. So please, wherever you are, 
reach out to me in the next day or so so we can have some further conversation. But because I'll tell you this, as a police officer, not only as a police officer, but as a police officer that's been involved in shootings and having been injured myself, I know how traumatic that is and the financial burden that's placed on families of police officers that go through that. And the one thing that, that Superintendent Klein did when he was superintendent and, and now all of us coming after him, it's my commitment, my pledge to you all that we will never forget you because we know the sacrifices that you make by your family members coming on this department and sometimes giving their life for the citizens of this city. So it's, it's an embarrassment to me that that question even has to be raised because that's not right. It's not right. And I, and I, I, I pledge to you, I will look into that to see what we can do to stop that from happening. There's no reason a police officer's widow should be homeless after that person gave their life to serve the citizens of this city. Two last questions. This is from uh, Kimball Layden, Dr. Layden. Um, you've talked about uh, programs after school for the youth and your communities and that. Has the police department ever looked at developing similar programs for adults who are on probation and parole as a way of reducing criminal incidents and that? I know it's a very broad question and not really in your discipline. No, you know what, when I spoke a few moments ago about us knocking on doors, that's what that's all about. So now what we do as police, we identify people who are at risk to either be victims of gun violence or the perpetrators of gun violence. And we go to, the, go to them prior to an event occurring and we offer them outside resources. So we take external partners with us now to get them in programs, to put them back on the right path so that they can be productive members of, of the society. So yeah, we do have uh, uh, an initiative uh, that's been going on for a few years now to address just that very question. And the very last question before we have our drawing in that, um, <clears throat> there have been a number of uh, carjackings lately that have attracted all of our attentions. We turn on the news or read in the print news, it seems like it's an everyday occurrence. And I noticed that you commented uh, very forcefully on it uh, the other day. Um, could you share with us some of your thoughts on that. And the, I think someone said these are mostly juveniles. An interesting question would be, should the court system and others look at these juveniles who do adult crimes differently than the traditional juvenile profile? Okay, that's a, that's a great question. Is that somebody from the media that asked that question? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying. <laughs> no, that's a great question. So we've, we've seen a rise in, um, carjackings across the city. When, and one thing I will share with you all, you know, there's a false narrative out there that gang members are dummies, and that's just not the case. You know, some of them could be CEOs of Fortune 500 companies if they chose to focus their energy in that direction. So there's a narrative out there by gang members that if they commit these carjackings, the Chicago Police Department won't go after them. Well, they are sadly mistaken. They, 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 they missed a target on that. And, and I tell you, it, it, it infuriates me that we've seen this, but it's because, uh, and I'll give you an example of it. So a couple days ago, you all may have heard about this on the news, we had a carjacking on the west side and the police uh, gave chase, right? These guys, with the help of the FBI and our uh, helicopter in the air, we were able to track these guys and ultimately chase them down, right? When they got out of the, when the officers pulled them out of the car, one of them looked at the police and said, what are you doing? You're not supposed to be chasing us. Yeah, okay, I tell you what, <laughs> you do it in this city, we're coming to get you. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just incredible to me that now they think that they have a, a leg up on this police department because we won't come after, yeah, we will. We will, we're gonna get you, trust me. You keep doing it, we're gonna catch you and we're gonna come at you with everything that we have. But in terms of juveniles, we have seen a spike in juvenile offenders. And again, that's because the way the judicial system is set up, 
the gang members, the older ones, the adults, recruit these young guys to do it because they know the consequence in the juvenile justice system is different from the adult justice system. So this is what I would say to that. I understand that a juvenile's mind isn't fully developed and they can be influenced by these older guys. But at the end of the day, there has to be a consequence for committing those types of crimes because if we don't, that's sending the message that you can continue to do it and you'll get a slap on the wrist. Now, I don't know where the sweet spot is for that, but I can tell you all this. We're, we're working with um, our judicial partners in the state's attorney's office to figure out the right balance. But I know this as a young man growing up. If guys don't have a consequence that they fear more than the thrill they get out of doing it, they'll keep doing it. So it's incumbent on, upon us to really let them know that this type of behavior won't be tolerated, at least not in the city of Chicago. So again, I say to them, keep doing it because we will eventually get you. We will. Thank you. Folks, let's give the superintendent a big hand. Thank you. Your son's not here. Man. No, he just supposed to be in my son. Get out of here, man. I, j I just asked Superintendent Johnson if his uh, son was here because we wanted to recognize him. We should also make sure that everyone gets some credit and you keep coming back. You started here at the Civil Law Group. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay. It just so happens that uh, Superintendent Johnson's son started at the Chicago Police Training Academy today, <laughs> and we wish him well. And my president, Jay Doherty, just uh, said to me, don't forget to mention that the legislation that the superintendent, Mayor Emanuel, uh, Senator Kwame Raoul worked on that was passed this season in Springfield regarding guns and that started here at the City Club. So we are very impressed with that and very pleased. Let me make a comment about that real quick. That he's, he's absolutely right. That conversation started here. And I remember you all asking me, what could you do to help us push that bill forward? And I said to you then, call Springfield. Many of you all did, and that made a difference. Because I had a couple of them say, would you tell them to stop calling me? <laughs> no, I won't. Not until we get it done. So thank you all. Thank you, City Club, for helping us with that. Okay, don't